Alright, sorry, this video is going to be two parts because technology. Um, the last um, bit of part one, I was referencing Mayari Adriano's post about how, um, and thank you again for sharing your abortion story, but she had mentioned that a couple years ago she induced her own abortion at home using neem oil, N-E-E-M oil. I was mentioning that I know what neem oil is, I had just never heard of it as being used as a naturopathic way to induce abortion. So um, as much as I want to caution people to take um, said matters into their own hands um, without the advice of a medical professional, um, I do think that her post was very, very poignant and very relevant insofar as being an Asian American woman and uh, just a woman that I know personally it was very, very invested in, um, you know, being and utilizing the resources of our of our heritage, of our elders, of our indigenous lineages, because obviously women have taken these matters into their own hands since the dawn of time. Like women have been inducing their own abortions in some form or fashion without the aid of a doctor or whomever um, and have looked to tell the tale, right? So I'm very interested in hearing from both, you know, professionals um, in of, of Western traditional modalities and of course from people that may have um, leaned on or utilized or are part of, you know, other modalities that are non-traditional, non-Western, and or anyone that has induced safely um, their own abortion and, and, and can tell us about what, what they did. Because I do think that although we, we, we don't want to be careless and I don't want to encourage, again, anyone to be using a coat hanger or using some fucking random essential oil and just like douching it up their fucking badge or, or whatever like that's not what we're about but I think like this taking back ownership over the process um, even from the medical community um, is something that Mayari uh, brought attention to and I think it's obviously a larger discussion but I think it's a fucking killer one and let's fucking have that discussion like if you've had an experience where you have um, induced your own abortion naturally and safely, I I want to hear about it personally. I want to hear about it, and um, yeah, I want to fucking hear about it. And I'm sure other people do too. So I just want to thank you to anybody that is. Um, been kind enough to share their experiences. Um, I did share mine on the live, so I'm going to do a, a tight recap now. Um, I was with somebody monogamously and completely from the time I was 19 until the time I was 30. And then for like three years later, but like it was on and off very messy. During those first, um, from 2002 to 2013, I was with one man. Now this man, um, some of you know, some of you don't know, or know of. I just want to say, and I, and, and I, I did not preface this in the live, I'm going to preface this now. I love this man, I will love this man to the day I die. Um, not in love with him anymore, obviously. Um, a lot of shit has gone down. Some of you know the drama. Watch my previous videos and you can see me cry about it. Despite everything that I said on the live, and despite everything I will reiterate here, he was very supportive during this process. Um, 
that I can never take away from him. So this gentleman had non-Hodgkin's lymphoma when he was 17. Um, luckily, thank God, and hopefully forever, it never comes back, but we started dating early on um, into his remission, and we were told, uh, he was told, we were told from Jump Street that because of the chemo and because of the radiation, he was sterile. So aside from the initial, you know, few months or however long it was where we were still using protection because we didn't know, um, for about 10 years plus, like there was no protection because, um, and I was not on birth control, I've, I've never been on birth control in any form or fashion, um, but I was not on birth control, um, we had sex and without fear of pregnancy and then there was one incident where I was like a week late and I had never been late so I'm, even to this day I'm super regular um, and I took a home pregnancy test and it was like terrifying because my two greatest fears in life are pregnancy and death pregnancy less so now that I've lived through the experience I'm about to tell you but um, Pregnancy was literally as scary as death to me um, my entire life. I just never related to the experience. I was never like a girl that like wanted to grow up and be like a mom. Like I, I, anytime I thought of being a mom, like it was only in the capacity of adopting a child. I was never like, oh, I want to have a baby. I want to be pregnant. Like that was not me. Um, it's still not. But anyways, um, there was one incident where like I was like a week or two late and I freaked out and it ended up being nothing. Flash forward to 2010, um, we were already making, not making plans, but having conversations about getting the fuck out of Orlando. Like it was something we both wanted and me probably more so than him, but anyways, like I was late, and you know how when you're about to start your period, like you you can feel it cut, like you can feel like the blood coming. I'm not talking about emotionally or hormonally, but like just like the feeling of like it's it's a coming. I had that feeling, but the blood didn't come, and I kept having that sensation, like that physical sensation, like I'm about to start, I'm about to start, and I just didn't start. And we're going like two weeks now, and I'm freaking out freaking out like my worst fear is coming true i did not take a home pregnancy test i'm i was so certain that something was wrong and like not right that i just went right to like making a doctor's appointment i took the day off i went to the doctor he went to work that's not like a slight on him like i was fine i was like i'm going to the doctor you go to work um and i just i remember sitting in the lobby and knowing I was gonna get like the news I didn't want. I was so fucking terrified. I was so terrified. I had, if you guys know me personally or if I've spoken about it at all in group, you know that I've dealt with anxiety and panic attacks over the past seven, eight years. This was prior to any of that. Like my mom was still in the throes of being a full-blown crack addict during this time, but like I had never experienced anxiety or panic, not not like in the traditional sense of like generalized anxiety or panic, like I would get like butterflies and anxiety when like, oh my mom would go missing or something, this is like a whole different story, but like I, I knew what anxiety felt like, but like it wasn't a, an everyday battle, right, like my shit was together, um, and I was terrified. I was absolutely, like, I was terrified. And I, I remember, or maybe I'm misremembering, I don't know, but I think I called him from the lobby to check in. Um, I might be making that up, I don't know. But anyways, the nurse called me in, and the nurse was who, who I was engaging with the whole time. She was an amazing nurse. Um, I, she was my regular OBGYN for years. She was amazing. 
But she called me into the room and she said, congratulations, you're pregnant. And we talked about this on the live. Like, I, I'm hoping that people are trained not to do that anymore. Um, because it's wholly inappropriate because you don't know what somebody's reaction is going to be to finding out that news. But she was like, congratulations, you're pregnant. I mean, she wasn't like, ah, but she was like, congratulations, you're pregnant. And I just, I kind of went into like a state of like numbness or just like, ah, I, I don't know what's going on. I don't feel anything like something naturally God my chemicals, whatever, like washed over me and was just like protecting me and just was like lubricating me. It was just like, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Anyways, so she was like, congratulations, you're pregnant. And I had already told her like about, like we're trying to leave, like we're trying to get out of Orlando. And she's like, you know, she was very kind. She was like, it's okay. Like plenty of people like get pregnant and then and during a move and like you can still do this you can still leave and like she wasn't trying to like sell me on having the baby she was she was very much like trying to like reassure me and saying like no matter what like you can still have be pregnant and still have a baby and still make your like dream come true so i mean she was she was excellent um aside from like the congratulations part like she was very 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 um good um, but anyways, yeah, so, like, my worst nightmare was, had come true, and I, I got in the car, and I called him from the parking lot, he was at work, and I told him, and I'm trying to actually remember, like, how he reacted, I think he was fairly stoic, I could, I, I, I could tell that he was trying to, like, be, like, supportive and not like have like a visceral reaction for my sake which again to his credit like he was not he was pretty much as perfect as you could expect somebody to be in this situation um anywho and then I remember getting like driving and then calling my mom and then like crying and telling my mom like I for sure like didn't want it because I knew I didn't want it um I knew if I kept it, I would never leave Orlando, which, who knows, maybe I would have, but at that point in my life, I, I knew, like, if I had this baby, first of all, I'd be stuck in Orlando, which I had already been stuck, like, been wanting to leave for, like, five, six, seven good years. Like, I knew, like, this would make it damn near impossible to, like, get the fuck out. And I also knew I would be having it for him because he wanted it and uh, one of the things I mentioned in the live was because he, we thought he was sterile and had no incidences for over 10 years he thought his initial reaction was that I had cheated on him which I had not nor have I ever um, and, I, and I get it like I, I get it like I, I could understand like why his mind went there I get it um, and he wasn't like a rage monster about it, but it, he definitely was like, what the fuck? Um, so once we got past that, um, I, my mind was immediately made up because this was my worst nightmare. And as much as like my nightmare was feeding into this and like it became like a self-fulfilling sensation of like, this is horrible this is exactly what I always thought it would be so it is that you know like I didn't even give myself even the opportunity to feel anything good about it because I was so terrified and because I had built up in my mind like this is just uh, everything about this is wrong but that's what it was like it was wrong it felt exactly like what I always thought it would feel like which is like a parasite like I wanted it out of my body I was having like a full-blown like alien moment like Ridley Scott realizations like the face hugger i.e. Ryan in my vagina was like the face hugger and then like the fucking thing inside of me was like xenomorph like ready to burst through my chest like I wanted I wanted it out I felt nothing about it felt natural nothing about it felt natural I did not feel like a mother I felt like something was in me that didn't belong get it out
I remember, um, and I still feel this, I still carry this, but I remember feeling guilt because once we like calmed down and I did take a couple days to make a decision, even though I had made mine, but like as a couple to make the decision, um, I just knew I was taking something away from him because once he realized like I hadn't cheated on him, like it became like oh, I'm going to take away from him his one and only chance maybe to have a baby. And I still get fucking emotional 10 years later because I feel like I took something from him. Um... And then I had to go to the clinic and get it done. And I had to, you have to like wait like a couple of days. Like they make you wait from the time you call to make the appointment. Like it's not like you can go in the same day. Like, first of all, they're booked the fuck out because hashtag abortions are necessary. And that's why there's people lined up for days for them but anyways like I there was I think like 48 or 72 hours between the time like I called Epoch Clinic and shout outs to Epoch Clinic in Winter Park I remember my mom had gone there for her procedure um I'm sure many of you are familiar with Epoch like Epoch is amazing if you are in Central Florida and you are in the um they're amazing but the experience still is not amazing um, I talked about in the live how like there were picketers and um, thank you again Sunny for sharing your experience um, of growing up in a household where you were unfortunately your mother um, brought you um, as a picketer when you were still fairly young to clinics um, yeah thank you for sharing that but yeah there were picketers there not a lot there's probably like 10 or 20 and I know like my man was just like ready to go off on them and I was just like please like just get let, let's get through this um and we went in and you're not allowed to bring anything in you can bring your phones and so we had to put our phones back in the car and I <laughs> remember the Aubrey O'Day reality show was the only thing playing on TV and you want to talk about a nightmare within a nightmare it was like inception but Leo was nowhere in sight, and also, like, a fetus was about to get vacuumed out of my cooch. But, like, everybody in the lobby was, some of, it, it, there were some really young girls, and some of them were alone, which was terrifying, and luckily I wasn't alone. Um, but the whole thing is, like, so long. Like, I, I remember being there, this might be an exaggeration, but I think it was, like, the better part of a day. Like, I remember being there for, like, ten hours. Because you're fucking in the lobby, waiting for at least an hour, maybe two. And then they bring you in, and you have to, like, talk to a counselor, have an AIDS test. Then if you're with your partner, they invite them in if they want to do the same, which we did. And then you go back into the lobby, and then you wait some more. And then what they do that's amazing, and I don't know if every clinic does this, but they when they finally call you in... They call you in with another woman uh, who's having the procedure, and they take you into like a, a waiting room inside the clinic, inside the back area rather, and they sit you there, the two of you alone, um, so you're not waiting in a room alone. Um, and I remember she she seemed a little bit older than me. I was what was this? 2010. I'm like 26, 25. She seemed a little bit older, and she was much more further. She was much further along. Um, she was showing. I think she was second trimester. She got called ahead of me, and then I got called, and it was first time I remember having a full blown panic attack. As soon as I went in, there was a doctor, and an, I think there was a, there was definitely a nurse. There may have been more than one uh, nurse in the room. The doctor was male. He had like, he looked like Albert Einstein. He had like crazy hair. Um, everybody was really nice and calm and kind and like just, they, they, they were doing their best. They knew what the fuck they were doing. And I 
I just remember saying, like, I'm not okay, I'm not okay, like, I'm freaking out, I'm freaking out. And I remember him saying, like, have you ever had an abortion? Have you ever, which he obviously could see from my chart that I had him, he was like, have you ever done anything like this? Like, have you ever had a panic attack? And I was like, no. It's like, it's okay, I'm going to make sure you're all right, I'm going to give you something. And he, I ended up getting clonopin for the first time after my abortion. Praise be. Um, but I remember, like, getting undressed getting on the table and, and this was i this was before you were made and i don't know if florida makes you now legally look at your ultrasound um obviously many states do I, I i don't know if florida is one of them but they did not make me look at the ultrasound but they have to do an over the belly ultrasound so like they know what the fuck they're doing right um, and then the, the nurse gave me the option, she's like, do you want to see it? And I said, yes. Um, and I showed this in the live. Um, I, I still have it. This is, this is her. And it's just like... It's even hard for me to find it. I mean, it's like, just like this little black... You can't even see that. It's just like that little black space on camera. I mean, I was six weeks. Like, it was just a little spec right um and then give you the option like do you want to see it do you want the picture i was like yes you know kodak moment right um and then i remember i already have major anxiety even to this day i'm going to the guy now like i hate anything being inside of me it took me from the t i got my period when i was 11 i put my first tampon in when I was in 10th grade, I was 16, that's how, it took me five years to be able to even put in a tampon, like, I just don't like shit inside of me, um, I hate going to the gyno, this was my worst fucking nightmare, and I paid for twilight sedation, which is basically, like, full fucking sedation, it would cost me, back then, it cost me, like, $600 for the whole thing, I wanted to be knocked out, like, I knew I was not equipped to be, mm -mm. no, 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 um, I had had a hysteroscopy previously because I had um, severe menstrual pain and ovarian cyst ruptures and that's why they put like a camera way the fuck up into your uterus. Um, anytime they go past your cervix, it's not fun. And I was just like, if I couldn't handle, and I was awake for that obviously, but this I was like, no, like I don't want to, I don't, I can't. And I remember them putting the anesthesia in my IV and they were like, okay, we're gonna do like two rounds of this and I was just hyperventing and I was like, okay, talk me through this, like, can you tell me when the first one's in? And they're like, okay, the first one's in, I was like, okay, can you tell me? And then I just was out. And then I woke up fully clothed in the recovery room, which is basically a room full of like, I don't even remember, like five, six, seven, eight, nine leather lazy boys and you're just, you wake up and there's just like a paper cup with orange juice and a straw in your mouth and you're like, how do I get here? And then you look around you and there's just like a bunch of bitches like half dazed and confused in the same situation and that's where you get your wits about you and then you're escorted out to the lot, not to the lobby, but um, whomever is accompanying you home comes into the back area and then they escort you out the back way where there's also picketers and I remember the woman that I was in that waiting room with left before me because she obviously had her procedure right before me and she was alone and she just fucking got in her car and drove off and it was just like how do you do that like how do you do that and I remember her being now that I'm telling the story for the second time I I'm almost certain she said she was on like a lunch break or something. I don't want to hear anybody shit on a woman that's had an abortion. I just, I just don't want to hear it. Um, easy decision, hardest thing to ever do. I said this in a live. It is what began. Not that we didn't have problems, because we did, even way back then. That be that was the be the true beginning of the end of my relationship. Like, there, there's, there was no coming back from that. Um, yeah.
it sucked. It sucked balls. It still sucks. And uh, I talked about in the live, um, she, again, I say she because that's intuitively what I, what I feel. Obviously, I don't know the gender. Um, she has a name. She had a name since Jump Street. I had a dream um, shortly before this happened, before I became pregnant. I was adopting a child, and the child had a name, and that, and that's what, um, what we named her. But she would be about seven. Um, she'd be eight in November, actually. Um, and that just trips me the fuck out. And so I don't want to hear anybody, like, I mean, I'll hear it, I'll listen to it, I'll have the conversation, but it's just, like, we talked about this in the live, like, no woman wants to fucking kill a baby. And it's so interesting because I very rarely post on my personal Facebook page anymore, I haven't in years, unless it's something super important. This group is really the only reason I'm on Facebook, you know. I participate in Instagram and that's about it, but, um my one of my aunts by marriage not tina who i referenced before but my father whom i didn't know growing up and who's no longer with us um his brother uh, my uncle steve who i love um his ex-wife so like you know you get it like my aunt by marriage um is part of this group she may not be anymore um but i she had commented on something i had posted on my personal Facebook, which is about like the abortion ban, and she was like, infanticide is worse than the Holocaust, and you should smile because your mom chose to have you, and I've known she's very like religious and, you know, very much living that Christian life, but, and I use the term Christian loosely, but I called her out, and I was like, first of all, abortion is not synonymous with infanticide, I mean, all you need to do is access a dictionary to know that, um, but no, you know, just like people that like commit suicide, I mean, not to compare abortion to suicide, but like, nobody actually wants to die, they just don't want to live, and they don't, can't seem to find an alternative, so like, nobody's going, nobody that's pro-choice or that has an abort, has had an abortion is like, uh, pro baby killing or maybe they are I mean I god bless you and your beliefs but like I'm quite certain like most people that are pro-choice or or whom have had an abortion are not super stoked about having a globulous gelat gelatinous amorphic pre-vertebrate sack vacuumed out of their cooter um and i'm quite certain even fewer women are excited about having a vertebrate uh has a heart maybe has some other uh organ systems um some limbs uh i'm quite certain no woman is going into that situation looking forward to having that entity torn apart inside of them and again vacuumed out of their fucking cooter uh if you think women are like doing this willy-nilly you should get checked out by a doctor post haste I don't know like I don't even know what to say anymore like Amy thank you for like saying what you said in that comment uh, about like just sitting in this like fucking like hopeless state and, and for Sunny touching on it in your live video about like just feeling lonely and like um yeah like whether you've had an abortion or not like just even having to think about these things and it's just it's already hard enough 
then you layer on like having like the biology that we do like you know and the responsibility that comes with that and having to like protect that and keep that from getting inseminated and preventing conception and then what happens when you do and then this and then the repercussions to your relationship and your family and your religious beliefs and all of this shit you know or like if you want to get pregnant and you fucking can't like, like all of this fucking psychology of just shit that unfortunately and I, I biological men have their own fucking issues to deal with I can only imagine what those feel like and the pressure that comes along with those and especially now when like they're getting the fuck it's their fucking turn to eat a fucking dick like I'm sorry but not sorry but like I also like understand like there's a different set of societal pressures but when it comes to fucking biological pressure you don't have the pressures that we do you do not have the biological hormonal and and therefore psychological pressures that we do you do not have a fucking biological clock that's telling me at 36 somebody who's never wanted a kid uh you better get to fucking having a baby like yesterday because even though you might be able to like viably have a baby like for the next 10 years like uh you ain't got enough money you ain't got a man you ain't got the like why am i having to have this fucking conversation with myself i didn't fucking ask for this like i can barely keep fucking teeth in my cat's head <sighs> you want to know why i drink you guys want to know why i drink you always want to know let's see you okay are you okay melissa we love you melissa are you okay? i'm okay i'm okay but like I gotta lube, I gotta grease the wheels. We all gotta grease the wheels in our own way. And it just, it's also like, again, like another layer. It's like, I, I have to think about, even to this day, I think about my ex and I'm like, what if I had that baby? Would I still have him? Not that I want him anymore, but like, I still love him and there's still like all of those things and like eh. and it's like what if I had had that baby and I was living my happily ever after that I didn't even know could, could be like maybe I could have been happy living in Orlando and these are just things that they're unfair but they come with the territory right like you're born with female reproductive or organs and hormones and and i i don't know maybe um trans women when when you are going through the hormone transition maybe you are starting to feel these things too i don't know but i know i can only speak to biologically females uh biological females um these are just like unfair things to have to like deal with um and it's par for the course, you know, whatever. Um, I guess if you're responsible for bringing life to Earth, you have to deal with this shit. Um, the misguidedness, though, of, like, feminism, i.e. going back to, like, the Alyssa Milano, like, sex strike, and then that fucking senator that's trying to introduce a bill to punish men who masturbate, it's like, okay... Th this is where we're gonna put our efforts and our energies like no 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 not today not today Satan like there are real fucking problems women need real help um jizz is going to continue to jizz I don't think like masturbation is a sin and if we punished every man who ejaculated um there'd be no men um ejaculation and masturbation is a part of life it's just fucking misguided. It, I mean, I, I, I see, like, the rage and the wrath and, like, the punitive and, like, the, like, let's turn the tables and, like, the comedy of it all, but it's also, like, you're a congresswoman, a congressperson, 
why aren't you like writing legislation for like harsher punitive um recourse for like rape i i it's just like exhausting and it's exhausting to discuss always and anyways i i don't know i'm gonna like just like what else is there to fucking say honestly um and one of the things i forget in which post it was um I think it was on the, I think it was on the post about the Alabama governor, the female governor, um, who signed the abortion ban into law. And you guys can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that's the post. But um, there was a little bit of a dialogue um, between some of our members, and specifically um, C.J. Brown had mentioned some. Are you right, Vicky? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, C.J. Brown had mentioned something to the effect of, like, let's, you know, maybe not go so hard on her because, you know, people of a certain generation and or people just of certain belief structures, like, um, you know, that's, that's their paradigm, right? Like, and, and, but also C.J. was saying, like, there, there are a lot of people that haven't, quote unquote, done the work, right? Like, they haven't done the work to make themselves aware of opposing viewpoints or bring themselves out of their own ignorance. Um, and Sonny um, had counterpointed by saying something to the effect of, again, I'm not gonna articulate this exactly right, um, that you know there's a certain amount of privilege that comes with awareness, right? Like you don't know what you don't know. And I think they're both correct, obviously. Um, we all need to do the work, but Excuse me. Um, we don't know what we don't know, and if you're in a bubble, some people have the wherewithal for whatever you know, based on whatever variables, whether it's education or inner will or curiosity to pierce that bubble and ask bigger questions and allow themselves to rub up against different um, perspectives and worldviews and, and therefore um, you know may eventually hit a crisis which forces them to reevaluate and evolve and then there are those of us who don't have that privilege of enough access to information that would even allow us to think to pierce that bubble or question the bubble or reality in which we live um so how w this begs the question of how do we toe the line as allies um as um progressive women who and i'm, and I'm speaking for me and people who agree with me now obviously who are pro-choice and who just want to advocate for an individual's right to autonomy, specifically a woman's right to um, decide what happens to her, how do we toe that line um, between respecting other people's beliefs, whether they be faith-based or political or just experiential, um, like being respectful to that versus enlightening them versus you know without preaching or without shaming like what what is it it's just it's like an impossible line to toe just like it is with racism like how do you have a conversation with somebody you love deeply and who's in your family but that's a racist you know like how how like how do you respect and not shame and not I'm guilty of this. I, I did this, like I mentioned earlier, with my aunt, not not Tina, my aunt by marriage, Candace, on my personal Facebook page earlier, um, in her comment, like, I, I went in for her. Um, I went in for her immediately in a very sarcastic, obviously um, satirical way, and then immediately felt guilt, and then wrote another comment to qual qualify it. 
and even that was going in on her. Um, But I'm just really up to here, especially as somebody that's fairly well educated about the Abrahamic religions and the Old Testament and the New Testament and growing up Roman Catholic. Like I'm really up to here with Christians who are not in any way, shape or form about Christ, Christ consciousness or even like the historical Jesus's message, but are just about like dogma and like nothing is based on fact. And when you compare abortion to infanticide, you've already lost your argument because you're fucking not even talking about the thing that you want to talk about. But number two, you know, one of the things I I I, I find interesting, and, and I want to thank Nicole Smith Talbot for referencing. Um, so, uh, like a, I think it was a retweet or an Instagram that you, you posted in one of the comments about Judaism's take on abortion, which is basically they um, are not anti Judaism is not anti-abortion, and I and I actually wanted to um, reference that if I could um, very quickly, like what. Um, Judaism specifically, and uh, as a result, I, I won't speak on Islam right now because I haven't done enough research on it, but um, I wanted to speak very briefly about like the Old Testament and the New Testament and, and also Judaism and abortion because Christians will, will very quickly, not all Christians I'm generalizing, but people of faith will often come very quickly with a denunciation of abortion because you know life begins at conception well i begin i believe life begins at conception but that doesn't mean that doesn't um god i have the same trouble articulating this in a life just because life begins at conception does not um preclude uh the right to abortion or the fact that abortion is a fact of life anyways so Religious people, specifically Abrahamic of the Abrahamic uh, phase, will very quickly uh, like to say that their faith forbids um, X, Y, and Z when it comes to abortion. But you know, I'm not certainly going to um, say I'm, uh, any authority on religious or biblical studies, but I've read enough and studied enough to know what hasn't been said. And I found an article that was written, this is actually from tw November 13, 2014, you can find this, it's a Time Magazine article written by Katha, K-A-T-H-A, last name Pollitt, P-O-L-L-I-T-T. This was written in November 13 of 2014, and this is a uh, six myths about abortion as it relates to the Bible. And what's interesting is obviously the Old Testament is very fire and brimstone when it comes to women in, in all facets, specifically menstruation, um, rape, just uh, we, we, we were not uh, too fond of, of the goings on of, of the female biology, um, you know, in the Old Testament, in the Torah, we just, we weren't about that life. So what's interesting is um, in a lot of people apparently will cite a certain Old Testament passage from Exodus to substantiate anti-abortion rhetoric, specifically Exodus chapter 21, 21 excuse me, verses 22 to 23. And if I may, they read as, if people are fighting and hit a pregnant woman, and she then gives birth prematurely, but there is no serious injury. The offender must be fined whatever the woman's husband demands and the court allows. But if there is serious injury, you are to take life for life. So essentially, like modern day abortion opponents will or have been interpreting the passage as saying that um, if damage is caused to the fetus, then that warrants like taking 
somebody else's life punitively, whether it's the person that caused harm to the woman and her fetus, or maybe even the woman it's herself. It, it does not say. It's it's it's. Anyways, the New Testament. Do not even get me started. Like everyone that wants to like cite Jesus and their Christianity as a reason for being anti-abortion can just. I don't even know what to say like I want to be diplomatic and I want to be kind and I want to have a dialogue but I'm just I'm just over people like citing the New Testament specifically citing the, either the historical Jesus or Christ um, and or both incorrectly I'm just I'm over it um, <laughs> because Jesus and this is even in the Time article Jesus considered uh, Jewish divorce at the time too lenient. He considered uh, he did disapprove of stoning adulteresses. Ten points for Gryffindor. Um, and he did never he he did not shrink from healing a woman who had an issue, which in the New Testament would generally refer to a woman who was having some sort of hemorrhaging or bleeding, um, vaginal specifically. Um, there, there's actually a, I, I forget who the woman was, but there was a specific uh, parable where he heals a woman who has been bleeding for 12 years straight. Um, please comment if you know her name. Um, but there's no talk of abortion. St. Paul didn't speak of abortion. I'm like, there's no commentary in any form or fashion in the New Testament, whether by Jesus or his fucking apostles, canonical or not, on this fucking topic. So stop citing Christianity. If you want to cite fucking Judaism and the Torah, let's go there. So in the Torah, not in the Torah, in the Talmud, in traditional Judaic law, it's actually permitted. And actually, the life of the mother is given precedence. So, let's get into that, shall we? Um, I'm reading specifically an article um, about, it's called The Fetus in Jewish Law. This is by Dr. Fred Rossner. I'll put all of these links below. An unborn fetus in Jewish law is not considered a person. In Hebrew, nefesh literally means soul. So. A fetus in Jewish law is not considered a nefesh, or a soul, until it has been born. The fetus is regarded as part of the mother's body and not a separate being until it begins to egress from the womb during parturition. I've never even heard this word before. Parturition, childbirth. In fact, only 40 days after conception, the fertilized egg is considered as, quote, near fluid. These facts form the basis for the Jewish legal view on abortion. Biblical, Talmudic, and rabbinic support for these statements will now be presented. I'm not going to go through everything, but they do reference back to that same Exodus chapter 21, verses 22 through 23, where scripture states that when men fight, when men fight, and one of them pushes a pregnant woman and a miscarriage results, the verbiage is slightly different in this article, but no other misfortune ensues. The one responsible shall be fined as the woman's husband may exact from him the payment to be based on the judge's reckoning. But if other misfortune ensues, the penalty shall be life for life. Now, um, Solomon ben Isaac, also known as Rashi, interprets this as no other, interpret, excuse me, no other misfortune to mean no fatal injury to the woman following said miscarriage. Um, they cite a bunch of other scholars who agree with his interpretation, concluding that when the mother is otherwise unharmed following trauma to her abdomen, during which a fetus is lost, the only rabbinic concern is to have the one responsible pay damages to the woman and her husband for the loss of the fetus. 
None of the rabbis raised the possibility of involuntary manslaughter being involved because the unborn fetus is not legally a person and therefore there is no question of murder involved when a fetus is aborted. Now, Moses Maimonides says, quote, if one assaults a woman even unintentionally and her child is born prematurely, you must pay the value of the child to the husband and compensation for the injury and pain. Similar declarations are found throughout rabbinic um, uh, testimony. It is the part of the mother, excuse me, regarding the status of a miscarried fetus. It is part of the mother and belongs jointly to her and her husband and thus damages must be paid. Uh, murder in Jewish law is based upon Exodus chapter 21 verses 12, excuse me, verse 12. Quote, he that smiteth a man so that he dieth shall surely be put to death. Commentary. The word man is interpreted by the sages to mean a man, but not a fetus. Thus, the destruction of an unborn fetus is not considered murder. In Leviticus chapter 24, verse 17, it says, And he that smiteth any person mortally shall surely be put to death. Again, however, an unborn fetus is not considered a person, nor nefesh, i.e. soul, and therefore its destruction does not incur the death penalty. Finally, this is in the Talmud. If a woman is having difficulty in giving birth and her life is in danger, one cuts up the fetus within her womb and extracts it limb by limb because her life takes precedence over that of the fetus. But if the greater part was already born, one may not touch it. For one may not set aside one person's life for another. Let me, let me, let me read that again. If a woman is having difficulty in giving birth and her life is in danger, one cuts up the fetus within her womb and it extracts it limb by limb because her life takes precedence over that of the fetus. Obviously, they're not referencing abortion as a elective surgery as we know it today, an elective procedure. But if you want to cite the Old or New Testament, if you want to call yourself a Christian, if you, if you want to cite that particular religion as an argument, you have none. Because there is no scripture from Jesus or his apostles to substantiate any commentary on the subject. The Old Testament has one pass, one chapter, literally one verse, that can be interpreted in any manner of ways. In the Talmud and Jewish tradition, specifically puts the mother's life in front of anything else and quite literally says that the fetus can be torn limb by limb if necessary to protect her life. So the protect her life portion uh, obviously is up for interpretation because they were probably referring to something medically necessary as opposed to something socio-politically necessary or whatever, but do not stand on ceremony with your Christianity if you do not have scripture, commentary to back it up. Um, and if anybody can um, produce um, chapter and verse, please do. Let's have a conversation about it. But as far as I can tell, from what I grew up with, from what I've read, from what I've studied, and from what I've researched over the past 48 hours, it ain't there. What is there is uh, love thy neighbor, um, you know, turn the other cheek, golden rule, you know, the, just the general, um, maybe don't be a fucking cunt if you haven't walked a mile. Mm -hmm.
these are the takeaways I have from Jesus is just don't be a fucking cunt um, so anyways there was a lot more I wanted to talk about but um, this has already gone two hours I love you guys thank you for watching um, I just much like in the live I want to implore you to be even within this space when we run up against um, folks that we disagree with to be respectful even if we're using emojis like please recognize that some things can get lost in translation um, you know just be aware of your tone when you're text when you're writing um, be respectful give other people the opportunity to clarify um, before going in on them and just remember to you know remember to remember that um, you have to walk a mile before and one of the great things about a lot of ind indigenous cultures is that they think generations forward so what is what we're doing right now excuse me how is what we're doing right now going to affect my grandchildren or my great-grandchildren or even their grandchildren like do you want it's 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 almost like an impossible favor to ask of somebody that is in a in an, in an opposing viewpoint who is locked into a dogma because their dogma their point of view their worldview their paradigm will not even allow them to indulge such a question so just be patient and forgiving and just realize we're not gonna make every uh, we're gonna have to agree to disagree and we're just going to have to share our stories which i think is the most important thing we can do rather than um debate share your story put a face to the situation i think that will go miles further than getting into a a debate. Anyways, I love you guys.